gets it uh, online and going, and he'll come down and, uh, and do that. I think he's ready. All right. Everything good? Good evening. I'm Pastor Matthew Peters, and I'm so glad that you came out tonight to hear Hans and Lisa. Hans and Lisa have their own coaching business, Health and Heart, offering services to those in need to get back on track. If they, they need someone who understands them and their family situation without judgment and can meet their clients where they are in their own lives. Hans and Lisa reside in Chesterton, Indiana, and have two daughters, Hannah and Delaney, who I believe are here this evening. Hannah and Delaney, give us a wave. Thank you, ladies. You are definitely a part of this journey as well. And there are three dogs who are not with us, Polly, Penelope, and Poisey. Po Posey. Although, Posey. Although they wish they would be. Although they wish they were here. I'm sure they do. Their family loves spending time together camping, going to concerts, traveling, enjoying the outdoors, serving others, and just being together. Hans and Lisa believe their family's addiction journey and story is a gift given to them from God to share with others in which they can provide support, encouragement, and, li and a listening ear to those who are walking the same dark journey their family has walked. A, a very close friend once told Lisa along the journey, this is the valley of darkness. These are the details of life. You will come through on the other side. God already knows your story, and he loves you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the journey that you have put Hans and Lisa and their daughters on and that you've brought them through the fear of being in the valley of darkness to faith, trusting in you and walking in a way that serves you and brings healing to others. Thank you for this time we commit it to you. We pray, Lord, that your will would be done in and through them and in our lives. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Hans. All right. Welcome. We want to thank Bridgepoint, Pastor Matthew, and all of you for being here tonight. And um, we are so grateful, and um, we are thankful for our story, as Pastor Matthew had mentioned, about addiction, recovery, and grace. And just thank you for taking your time tonight, and we hope you enjoy our I'll go ahead and uh, and I'll start with uh, with a prayer I had written. Also, can never have too many prayers, right? Um, so let's bow our heads. Dear God, I thank you for allowing us to share our testimony of faith and redemption with everyone who is here tonight. We come before you humbly, asking for your healing light for all who are suffering and struggling. Pray that our story may give clarity, hope, and understanding to those who need it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm Lisa, and obviously this is Hans, and Matthew had introduced our two girls back there, and then also with them is our daughter's boyfriend, Hannah's boyfriend, um, Luke. So we're thankful that they're here with us. Um, so just starting out, our book is called From Fear to Faith, and it is a family's journey with addiction, recovery, and grace. We share our story of the challenges of our marriage, raising our family, when a partner becomes addicted to alcohol, he hits bottom and seeks recovery. Through the book, you will learn how our fears turned to faith in God and eventually led them to keep our marriage intact while facing adversity in all areas of our family's lives. We have recently added a workbook to be used as a Bible study. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about my background previously to marrying Hans. So I grew up in Minnesota and had what I thought was a pretty normal life upbringing. My parents were married for 45 years until my mom passed away, and I have two sisters and a brother. We were brought up in a Lutheran church, went to church on a regular basis. I was baptized, made my first communion, and we were basically, and I was confirmed. All of us kids went to college, we graduated, I got a good job, married right out of college, and my parents taught us that we don't share our problems with others. We take care of, our, of them ourselves and within our family. 
My parents seemed to be successful. There wasn't addiction that I knew of, divorce in our family. They had good jobs and were a happy, loving family or couple. So obviously, they were a good role model and, a good God -centered, and had a good God-centered marriage. In my mind, I believed first comes marriage, a house, then a family. And after graduating from college, I married my college boyfriend. We built a house, and we were ready to start a family. But that didn't come as easy. We went through years of infertility and tried to adopt, but eventually that took a toll on our marriage. Our marriage ended, and I remember my parents telling my parents that I wanted a divorce from my first husband to move to Indiana. My thought was I wanted to do a, a good do-over for my life, for it wasn't going the way I planned. My mother wasn't going to hear of it, and my dad said to me, you know where you've been, but you don't know where you're going. But if you don't go, you may never know. Thank you, and a little bit about my background. Uh, you could probably guess with my name. I was born in Germany. We moved here when I was three years old. And uh, it was kind of, uh, kind of unusual because we moved here when I was three. Um, my dad had lost both his legs after World War II. So we moved here with me and my, my mom and dad, me and my sister. My brother came a couple years after we'd moved here. And we learned how to speak English by watching Sesame Street on TV. So, and that includes uh, my mom and dad as well. <laughs> so, but, uh, and I grew up, I went to uh, Washington Township High School. I went to school down at uh, IU, which after going to Washington Township was one big culture shock, let me tell you. Going from 36 class, kids in the class to 5,000. Um, and also I played uh, soccer, high, uh, travel soccer here. And I was very much of a... Um, big fish in a small pond. I was probably the best player in, in Northwest Indiana at the time. I went down to IU and the freshman class included five first, second, or third team high school All-Americans. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> that was quite, uh, quite a change. Um, I ended up after, uh, after college, I didn't end up getting a scholarship after a couple of years. I came up here and I finished school. I got different jobs. I, uh, had a job I worked in real estate for a little bit. I worked, um, I was at the Boys and Girls Club. I was started the boys soccer program at Valpo High School and I did that for seven years. And uh, like I said, I worked at the Boys and Girls Club. I was the director there, for, unit director there for often, uh, about 11 years in two different stages. And uh, then I ended up getting married and it was kind of a situation where like get married and okay, let's uh, we'll talk about kids afterwards. Well, we started to talk about kids after we'd been married for a while, and it's like, yeah, I want to have kids. I love kids. I don't want to have kids. <laughs> it's like, oh, we got a problem. So um, we um, divorced. It was a reasonably amicable divorce. Uh, just went uh, our different ways, and uh, um, that's uh, that's pretty much it. And like I said, I was working at the Boys and Girls Club. Ran into Lisa at a couple of different functions because we went to conferences and um, generally tend to um, go out and network and stuff like that at, in the evening. So um, I got to know um, Lisa a little bit. She got to know a few of the people that worked at the Valpo um, Boys and Girls Club at the time. It wasn't the big conglomeration that it is now. It was just uh, basically uh, Porter County. And uh, so that's how I got to um, know her. Mm -hmm. So, we don't meet people by accident. They are meant to cross our paths. But my, with my dad's blessing, I moved to Valparaiso, Indiana, where I got a good job, what, met a wonderful man who was smart, level-headed, mature, funny, loving, compassionate, and we had a lot in common. He, too, wanted a family, and most of all, he loved me and was going to make me happy. Hans and I got married. I was 34, he was 38. We got married at the beautiful Aberdeen here in Valparaiso, just with our immediate family, and we bought a nice house. We had two great jobs, and six months later, I was pregnant, and yay, finally, my life was going just as I had planned by moving to Indiana and with a do-over. My dream of becoming a mother came true April 30th, 2000, with our first daughter, Hannah, and then my pregnancy with Hannah was not easy. 
and I had pregnancy-induced high blood pressure, which put me on bed rest, as she was induced at 34 weeks, weighing four pounds, and spent 10 days in NIC unit. And then a year later, after bringing Hannah into the world, I became pregnant again with twins, and three months into the pregnancy, I lost one of the babies, but on July 14, 2002, we brought our second daughter, Delaney, into the world, a very healthy baby. Now my life was complete, married to my best friend, a healthy baby, healthy babies, and um, great friends. We went to the Lutheran church, the girls were baptized, made their first communion, I taught Sunday school, and Hans seemed to enjoy church as well. And Hans was not brought up in the church like I was. So when he went to church, he enjoyed the fellowship as well as the pastor. And we hosted church groups at our, church groups at our house as well as held life groups where we liked to entertain him. We felt connected in the church and had a great community of Christian friends. But at this time, I owned a gift basket business, which I ran from our basement so that I could juggle being a mother and having a career. And the gift basket business grew, and Hans quit his job and started working with me in the business. And we started to outgrow the basement for the business, so we decided to build a beautiful new house. And I was so happy, and my dream house, a great business, a wonderful husband, and two beautiful girls. Awesome. We got some new neighbors and friends, but what more can I ask for? Well, within two years of moving into that bigger house, things became very stressful. Business wasn't going as planned. The bills piled up. We, started prior we, we stopped prioritizing church. Hans and I fought a lot, and he would leave for a couple of days, and I didn't know where he was. He would return, and we would talk things out to make it better. I felt abandoned and resentful towards him. Many times, I felt, it, I felt blindsided. I remember him coming home after a time he had left, saying he went, he went to see a friend who is the director of Frontline, and she recommended he get some help. I said, no, we can handle this on our own. Because you see, Hans and I were both taught that to take care of things on our own. It was a crazy cycle we got ourselves into. We hardly went to church anymore and we shut ourselves out from our friends. When things started falling apart, we became more isolated from our friends and from God. Once again, we needed a do-over. We took on way too many things, the big house. We thought if we moved to a smaller house, like the house that we moved in when we first married, we'd be happy again. We moved and the problems followed and God was less and less in the big picture. We moved again and the problems still followed. I came home from work one day thinking Hans was at work and got a call from him saying he checked himself into the Michiana hospital for alcohol addiction. I was beside myself. How could he be so selfish and leave me with the two young daughters to take, er to take care of while he was taking care of himself? That was, an easy out, that was an easy out for him in my opinion. Then I realized it took a lot of guts for him to drive 70 miles to check himself into the rehab not knowing what was gonna come next. This was the beginning of a 10-year battle with alcohol addiction and codependency that came to lighten our family. It was a wild ride. During these years, our family was homeless. We lived in the basement of our friend's house. Our good friends changed, and we didn't know from day, from day to day what life was going to throw our way. Hans was in and out of the treatment centers, he tried to commit suicide on a number of occasions, and I was an emotional hot mess. I thought I could fix it, I could make it better, but I couldn't. Everything I thought my life was supposed to be was being taken out from under me. During this time, we were asked by some friends to attend their church, and soon found ourselves a part of a very loving church family. Our family loved going to church. Many of these people knew our family story, and they loved us unconditionally, gave us endless grace, and they were the hands and feet of Jesus. They prayed for us, with us, and they introduced us to an Indiana Dunes Great Banquet. We have found an amazing banquet community, and some of our closest and dearest friends are a part of. God said, this is my commandment, and you love one another as I have loved you. However, the alcohol continued, to take a toll on our family. I tried to control it. I thought I could cure Hans. 
for the, our family, and at times I really thought I caused it. But yet, it was destroying me. One thing I was doing was I was contributing. It was contributing positively or negatively. And it was hard to give Khan's grace over and over. One day I heard God whisper, surrender and give this to me. This is between Hans and I. Living a life of alcohol addiction was the furthest thing from my mind when I moved here to Valparaiso, Indiana. I, wanted peop I want people to know that our family is your neighbor next door. Well, everything may have been uh, looking wonderful on the outside, but the beautiful big house, the awesome community of friends, a dedicated husband, two amazing girls, one's life can be blindsided and turned upside down when stress and life events take over your marriage. Yes, it's my turn again. <laughs> We're gonna, we kind of do this the way that uh, we had written the book where she talks in a chapter, then I kind of talk in a chapter. And we kind of relate the same time frame maybe uh, from our own different viewpoints. So uh, I'll go back to um, the time around when I had uh, gotten uh, divorced. Um, at my second rehab, they had us do a thing called uh, a timeline. And uh, so I went, wrote down everything from graduated high school, college, on and on and on. And I realized that right around that time, that uh, there were significant life events, as we call them. And uh, and basically, in say it was like a four or five year period, I went through eleven of them, and they ranged anywhere from the divorce to a job loss to temporarily moving to Minnesota to um, meeting Lisa to Hannah to Delaney. And it just, uh, I wasn't able to deal with it, and I just started to spiral. And uh, like Lisa said, I ended up uh, going to three different uh, rehabs. I went to East Chicago, um, Plymouth, and uh, in, in southern An Indiana, which I'll get to in just a, a little bit. But uh, with all of that, initially I did what most people did is, I don't have a more than anybody else that I know. Of course, I just hung around with people that drank a lot. So that really wasn't, uh, that was just kind of a cop-out, which, which most of us end up, uh, end up doing. I, uh, I did have the, uh, the suicide attempt. And she left. I took some pills, and I lay down on the, uh, on the bed. And uh, as I recall, you forgot something. So she came home. So before anything, you know, anything worse could happen, it was probably 15 minutes after I, I had taken the pills and laid down, she was able to call the ambulance, and I went to, um, at, I'm trying to think, at the time, it might have been Porter, it might have been Porter Memorial, it might have been any <laughs> one of a number of names, but at that point, uh, I was there under um, guard for 48 hours. Um, and uh, ended up going to Porter Stark for observation for a few days. And uh, then I kind of realized that I, that I did have a problem, obviously, with alcohol. One thing that, uh, that we do, though, is uh, deny. We just deny you know, that it's as bad as it thinks, because if you don't deny it, you have to confront it, and that hurts even more. So, and... Uh, there's a saying that I like is uh, that people really don't change until until it hurts more to stay the same. Also, if anybody's heard me talk, <laughs> I do this every time. <laughs> every single time. <laughs> So you might have to bear with me a little bit, but yeah, nobody likes change. Change means you have to, no matter what, when you change, you have to give up something. And it's something that has been with you a long time, even if it's not good for you, you have to give up something when you change. And, you know, at that point, I was not, uh, not really 
you know, willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So, remember when I said, God said, surrender to me? So I did what God asked, I surrendered. It was the fall of 2014 and it was mid-October morning. Girls were at school and I was home with Hans. I went to take a shower and when I came back, he was gone. He left with my car, but he had no wallet and he had no phone. He was really gone this time. I got a phone call from the state police that, even, that evening and they said, we found your car on Highway 65, five hours south of Valparaiso. Do you know who was driving it? I said, yes, my husband. They said, they searched for him and he was nowhere to be found. 10, di 10 days went by and nothing from Hans and all I did was pray. God, I know you got this. I knew I was going to have to deal with whatever God sent my way. Our oldest daughter, Hannah, was to attend an awakening weekend, which was a teen version of our Indiana Dunes Great Banquet. And Hannah went to the awakening and I thought this is the best place for her during this time, surrounded by people who would be better equipped to handle this situation if we got the bad news. That weekend, I got a call after 10 days from the hospital in southern Indiana, and at, it, was, it was from Hans. He was in the hospital, and he was okay. He had no car, and he wanted to come home. This time, I said no, and he needed to get help. He stayed in southern Indiana at a men's house for six months, went to meetings, and got himself a job and supported us at home. Um, so, like Lisa said, I left. And uh, basically, the day after I had left, I woke up on a ditch on the side of Highway 6. And probably the worst thing was, I don't remember how I got here. So I got up, saw an exit sign, and I started walking. And uh, it was right at the end of October, beginning of November, so it was kind of chilly out. So my, uh, I, and I, I had car keys. I didn't have a car. I had some money, and that's pretty much what I found when I assessed it. So I immediately went to uh, um, not look for a hotel or a shelter. I went to look for a liquor store. So I did that. I found a liquor store. Then I went to a hotel, and I stayed there for 10 days. I ended up uh, calling a cab driver who would go and get me um, half gallons of vodka until he wouldn't do it anymore. So I was there 10 days. And I remember at the very end that I, re I remember, I, I was barely coherent, I was barely conscious, and I was laying on uh, the bed when I heard somebody at the door. And it ended up being EMS. They came, I couldn't get up, they ended up um, breaking the door down. And uh, took me to the hospital, and when I... Um, when I finally found out, they said that somebody, the front desk said somebody from the room had called them and said, come and leave. And, I mean, I know what shape I was in. It wasn't good. So, then I was in the hospital about three days on IV. And uh, they kind of figure out what to do with me because... I wasn't giving a lot of information or or anything. And finally, um, I woke up one morning and uh, at the foot of the bed was an Indiana State Trooper. Usually not a good way to wake up in the morning. So um, that was the first and only time, <laughs> I think, and hopefully the last time. But uh, he was there, and I mean, I kind of had a pretty good idea why he was there. Um, although he said, you know, I just, are you Hans Scheller? I said, yes. I just wanted to come and check on you. Just, just wanted to see if you're okay. So, I mean, that was probably the first time, probably the first time I really felt God's grace. Um, 
ended up that they decided there was one of two things. I could either go to um, homeless shelter in Louisville, or uh, they would check on a halfway house down in uh, Jeffersonville. So they did have one bed left at the halfway house. I, I still thank God that they did because I I got a pretty good idea what would happened if I would have just been turned loose at a homeless shelter in Louisville. And it wouldn't mean good. So I went to I went to the halfway house. I like Lisa said, stayed there six months. What they did um, was they found housing, or not housing, but they found a job, had connections with a local um, a plant, and uh, so I got uh, got a job there. And for those six months, I went to 190 AA meetings. I went every day, and I went uh, on weekends a couple times. And uh, the that separation, too, like what Lisa said, she mentioned the word codependent. And not only did I, was I able to work on myself, she was able to work on, on herself as well. So we were both separate, yet healing. So that just kind of kept on going, and I kept going to me. I mean, that was entirely my focus. And uh, some of the things I, I, I heard at meetings were... Um, there's a lot of different buzzwords with uh, um, with addiction, and uh, one of the most important things that I think I learned there, and I still do every single day because I put it into practice every single day, is perspective. And uh, that perspective, I heard at one of the meetings, it was extremely profound. And there was somebody, you know, who said that when when he'd had like 30 days of sobriety, he'd just relapse. It, he was it, he was sobriety wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And uh, he said because he thought sobriety was the gates of heaven opening up. And then and then he said. Sobriety is not the gates of heaven opening up for me. It's the gates of hell opening up for me. So, that happened early on when I was down there. One thing that was another one of the biggest eye-openers was that I realized alcohol was not my problem. I was my problem. And I wasn't going to fix that until I figured out why. So, I did a lot of... Uh, a lot of soul searching, um, and uh, you know, ended up that just kind of figuring out. I stress was a huge trigger for me. There's triggers is a, a big word in, in in addiction, and there's triggers. Most people think triggers for relapse, but there's triggers for recovery too. Works both ways, and uh, so I tried to avoid. Stress. I tried to avoid other things that I, I identified that were really causing me to 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 be, you know, to act the way that I did. Um, and uh, with the triggers for recovery, I realized Lisa and the girls were huge ones. That's what I had to focus on, um, because uh, Friedrich Nietzsche said, when you have a why in your life, it makes the how so much easier. So that, and that was kind of, uh, you know, they were my why. Um, so after that six months, I realized, okay, now, 
can't stay here forever, what am I going to do? Ended up uh, figuring out that before, and we had talked about it a little bit, we talked almost every day, right? Yep. You know, for just a few minutes, talked with the girls, Lisa, etc. cetera. Um, and so it's like, I can't just go back. I have to have a job. I have to have a place to stay. I have to, you know, have all these things in place. And we were not going to jump and just move back in together. So I put out a um, a thing on uh, on Facebook about uh, if anybody had an apartment or knew somebody who, you know, explained the situation. And uh, within a day, I got a response from somebody, and he said, "Hey, we got an extra room. You can stay as long as you want to." <laughs> and uh, funny thing is, they weren't even like close. <laughs> We had gone to church with them at Christ Lutheran years before. <laughs> but uh, that's what they said. And uh, I came back and um, ended up, uh, as far as a job, the, uh, and I know I'm going to get choked up here. You'll know why. <laughs> because the place that they, that I had worked at down there was a plastic injection molding factory. So every day, and again, I left at the end of October, beginning of November, so those six months obviously encompassed winter. And so every day about, uh, I did what my parents always said, you know, walk to work every day in the snow, two miles, uphill, both ways. <laughs> but it, it literally, except for the uphill part, it was walking in the snow back and forth. And uh, so... Uh, Lisa said, hey, why don't you give a call to, because when I was the director of the Boys and Girls Club, I got to know pretty much everybody in town, and I got to know um, the uh, Thorgren family. So Lisa said, hey, <laughs> why don't you give them a call? See what, uh, what they have. Well, I talked to, um, I talked to Rob. And he said, we really don't have anything right now. Let me talk to some people and see what, we can, what I can find uh, you know, from other people. And uh, he said, call me the next day. I called him the next day. He said, he says, I really don't uh, you know, have anything. But I was talking with my brother, and um, we need to hire a personnel director. And we have to do that. We have to hire somebody from outside the company. We don't want to promote anybody because there's um, affiliations and friends and stuff like that. We need to hire somebody from outside the company. He goes, do you want, uh, you know, would that be something you're interested in? I said, yeah, I'll get my resume together. I'll send it down to you. He said, you got the job. <laughs> so, and uh, long story short, it's been eight, a little over eight years now that I've been there. So, and, uh, you know, other stuff I've been doing is, is kind of like uh, um, things that, um, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but that that kind of made the, the transition to come back up here. So I stayed with uh, Matheson's. Um, we I went to you know to to work and um, did have a car. Although <laughs> when uh, and then after a few months, um, Lisa and the girls had gotten an apartment uh, in in Valpo by the uh, VFW, if everybody knows where that's at. So actually I had a car then, but when we moved back in together, at that point, if you know where Thorgren's is too, I could have walked to work in about 30 seconds. <laughs> it was like right over the railroad tracks. <laughs> but, uh, and it just kept, you know, kind of, uh, kind of getting better and, and, and getting better the whole time. Um, there was one thing that, I think it didn't happen until maybe six, seven years after the event, but when I was in the hospital, and uh, a friend of mine that I went out to um, dinner with, and we were both hardcore soccer partiers, the whole nine yards. He played at University of Michigan, I went to IU, and uh, we were uh, hedonistic is probably the right word. Uh, we were very much into ourselves. And uh, so we're sitting around um, at, 
Leroy's having dinner a couple years ago. We were writing the book. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, John goes, hey, you know, you should read Deuteronomy. I'm like, hey, you know, I think I'll go ahead and do that. So I went home and I did, and I found a phrase that encompassed kind of that specific time in the hospital. And to get an idea of John sitting around with me, and we're talking about Deuteronomy, comparable would be two kindergartners sitting around talking about quantum physics. There's no way it's going to happen. Anybody who knew us back then would be like, you're out of your mind. <laughs> you know, there's no way. But uh, it was Deuteronomy 3019. It said, This day I call the heavens and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death. Blessings and curses, now choose life. Because, I mean, when he told me that, I said, you know, I'm a more of a New Testament guy. Uh, I'm not so much the Old Testament, but I said, I'll go ahead and read Deuteronomy. I mean, I, I did Genesis, Exodus, and then I skipped a couple chapters. But um, So I read it, and I came on that phrase, and it's like, oh, my gosh. And that, I mean, that was a, a perfect fit for, uh, for, for part of the book. So... Um, so at that point, again, I'm back, and I'll turn it back over, over to you now. Okay. So, <clears throat> as Hans said, after six months, he returned back to Valparaiso, and he did reach out to his friends for a place to live and the company that he's working for, and um, they created him a job, and now he's been sober for eight years. <clears throat> And, as you know, so we're not telling you everything that's in the book, but our life did hit rock bottom. And it was never the life I had ever imagined or planned or wanted to raise girls, my girls in. But, you know, we had to rebuild. And the big house, the material things, they were no longer important to us. As our relationship with each other, with our community, and with our friends, but most importantly, with God. Ephesians 2.8 says, for by grace you have been saved by faith, and this is not your doing, it is a gift from God. So I was extremely fortunate to have a village of very good friends, a family, and loving church community that walked with us on our journey with this addiction. And in hindsight, have seen God's guidance through it all. I could tell you right now that where we are today, I would have never imagined 10 years ago. God has just done some great, amazing things because we have chosen to walk alongside him. And as we had mentioned earlier, I recently started a business called Heart and Health with Lisa because I want to make sure that people understand that they don't ever have to walk alone. And it was a very scary time. It was a very dark time. And I was very fortunate that God put many people in our lives, and some of those people are in this room, which I'm very fortunate, the village of friends. And they stood in the gap, and they were the hands and feet for us. No judgment, loved us unconditionally. And so I choose to live my life to walk alongside others, no matter who they are, because I want them to know that they do not ever have to walk alone. Um, I'm also a family recovery coach, and the purpose behind the book when it came to um, three years ago when we started thinking about writing the book, I wanted to write the book because I wanted to tell my story as, a, as the family side of the addiction, because many people talk, hear about the addiction side, but it's a family disease, and I wanted people to know that the family is just as affected by the disease as the addict is, and it becomes a whirlwind, that you're trying to put out these fires, you're trying to take care of things, your, your life becomes very unmanageable. And um, so I'm going to tell my side of the story, but then when we met with our editor, he said, our publisher, he said, well, how would Hans feel to tell his side of the story so that when people read the story, they can hear your side of what you were going through and then what he was going through. So for three years, we wrote this book. 
And we didn't talk to each other for probably about it. For we talked to each other. <laughs> we talked to each other, not about the book. <laughs> for two and a half years, he wrote, I wrote. And I'm not a writer. I hate English. I don't, that's not my thing. Um, so we wrote and we wrote. And um, during this journey, just like Hans was saying, how you know God stepped in for him um, with a job, somewhere to live, and bringing him back here. Well, along this journey, a friend was put in my life whose brother was going through some stuff. And come to find out that she was actually a writer. And she said, can I help you? And I'm like, sure, you can help me. So those are just ways that God has worked in our lives. So in July, after three years, the book was published. And since then, we have had um, and have been very blessed to share our story. And we share our story so that just maybe just one person will know that you're not alone. And it's not going to be fixed overnight. It didn't get there overnight. It is a journey on both sides. There's healing on both sides. I thank Hans for going through this um, and that I was a part of it because I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my upbringing and I learned about who I was as a person too, which has helped us in our relationship now because we both have chose to um, work on it. And so, um, yeah. My turn again? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, ever since... Uh... Um, I'd come back. It was first. I wanted to say too that um, when Lisa says the family disease, that's that's most definitely it. Um, the one difference between the family and the addict is that the family has to go through it sober. So makes it even more difficult, I think. But. So some things started to happen when, when I did come back. Uh, there were some um, thing I, I think I had mentioned perspective and, and the gates of hell. Um, other things happened perspective-wise. Perspective, I think every situation you can look at two different ways. Every situation. So shortly after coming back, went with a group of people um, camping up in Manistee and all from um, BNC Church, I believe. Okay. And uh, so we're camping. We had a great three days. And the final day on Sunday, um, the uh, pastor was given a sermon. We're outside, and it's starting to drizzle right at the end of it. And uh, it's like, uh oh. He finished up, and everybody's running to get packed up, get the tents going, and all of this stuff. And I'm just kind of walking around and um, putting stuff you know, way just like I normally would if it wasn't raining. And uh, somebody came up to me and said, aren't you worried about getting wet or anything? I said, well, I said, you can look at it as like a negative of getting wet, or I said, you can look at it like God's baptizing the weekend. <laughs> Perspective. Mm -hmm. So, other things. Um, gratitude. Uh, one of the things that you definitely learn in, in addiction because um, you have a, a very strong, a strong memory. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, um, gratitude turns pangs of memory into tranquil joy. So, and, uh, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer is one of my favorite authors. Uh, another thing with gratitude and also perspective, I think. You can look at it like when I was playing soccer, I never even take my, taped my ankles. Never had injuries, anything. Once I turned 30, <laughs> I tore my ACL twice. I ruptured my Achilles tendon. And uh, through it all, once, through it all, I, I had a lot of anger at that time. Now, when I think back and I look on it, it's like, I, I, I'm lucky. I am fortunate, because I told you my dad lost his legs in World War II. Perspective. So, um, another one would be, would be humility. A lot of people confuse humility with humiliation, which is not even close to the same thing. Humility, it's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less often. Um, and humility connects everything else. Humility 
is what gratitude, acceptance, perspective, and appreciation grow in. Everything can grow if you have humility. I, I feel that um, two things tend to define you, and that's your patience when you have nothing and your attitude when you have everything. So, so I think I'll turn back over to you to kind of finish it out a little bit. Okay, you done? Done. All right. So, in closing, we want you to know that life is a journey and it's not a destination. And we are honored to walk alongside you in the season of your life. And we wrote From Fear to Faith, Our Family's Journey with Addiction Recovering Grace so that people like you or your family and friends would not need to walk alone. Addiction is a family disease and affects everyone around you. And our mission is to help lift the stigma of addiction and to be part of the healing process. Our God is a strong and powerful God who can work miracles in your life. We pray that our book will help relate to addiction and assure you that recovery is possible. God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ, and grace is receiving by trusting Christ, and this is how we are able to give grace to others in our lives. It is our hope to encourage those that have ever felt the way our family once did that we can bring light into someone else's darkness. We pray that the light will shine through and you find community with your story and your story becomes someone else's survival guide. Let God be the one that you lean on for strength and courage. Let Jesus take the wheel and, and let him walk alongside of you as well. You guys might have, everybody might have got one of these bookmarkers, but God has a purpose for your pain. He has a reason for your struggles and a reward for your faithfulness. Yep, I'll go ahead. I've got um, a little bit more, and then we'll kind of do some some questions. But I just want to let you know what I've been doing late last, uh, my last couple of years, in addition to working and trying to keep them in line. Um, <laughs> yeah, I can say that up here in front of everybody. I don't do it at home. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so for about almost three and a half years, I've been working at uh, Recovery Connection here in Valpo. And I'm a peer recovery coach. Um, I do a, a podcast called uh, Recovery Reflections where I talk for a couple of minutes in regards to things like perspective, acceptance, gratitude, and so forth. Um, I do uh, SMART meetings, which is self-management and recovery training. And it's more of a facilitator-led um, meeting for um, people with substance abuse. And... Uh, it's just, you know, life has just lately been, people hear about stories about like an avalanche and just kind of coming down on you. It's kind of been like almost an avalanche going the other direction. <laughs> it's been pretty amazing because things have just, you know, are good and the, the more good that we do, it just kind of has that, like I said, reverse snowball effect. So did, uh, do we have time to answer a couple of questions? Mm -hmm. And we've got, actually, we'll start out, we've got a few of them that uh, we get pretty often. Um, so, uh, I'll, uh, people ask, do we think, do I think that alcoholism is hereditary? I, I think there, there can be some things passed along genetically to have a predisposition for it. Um, I also do think that that can either be mitigated or it can be exacerbated depending on your environment. Environment is, is huge. And, uh, you know, if you have a little bit of a predisposition to that or a history of it, and that's the type of environment you're in, then it, it makes it that much more likely. And on the other hand, too, um, depending on um, what, uh, you know, what type of upbringing you have, you you know, you may not have that, uh, you know, that issue at all. So I think there, there it can be predisposed to it, but it's not a, you know, it, you're going to get it type thing, not, not in the least. People ask, what's the best treatment? Um, like I said, I think finding out why, why is, 
you know, you know, just stopping drinking is not going to solve it. That's that's a band aid. You know, finding out why and then addressing that issue is the most important thing. And you use whatever you can, um, talking to somebody, talking, um, going to meetings, doing, you know, doing whatever. I I look at it like. You know, I know some people are strictly like, uh, do AA, do Celebrate Recovery, do SMART, do this. Do them all. You know, anything that, that will help is, you know, is, is beneficial. So, um, or is alcoholism uh, a disease or choice, too? I think that, uh, I believe um, that it, it tends to be a disease. I really do. Um, it's, uh, we kind of make that, you know, that choice, but at some point when you start to make that choice, um, um, got a, um, one of my clients has a, uh, uh, actually a statue. He's doing really well. He's got a statue, and uh, it has a picture of um, a guy who has his head in a, a bottle. And when you look at it, it says, um, first man takes a drink, and then drink takes the man. So, you know, I think that kind of, you know, kind of says that it can if you're, you know, if you're, if you're not careful. So, do you have any questions you want to, or do we, we want to turn it over to them? For a couple. Mm -hmm. okay. Anybody, any, any type of questions? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I would say when people start to uh, open that door just a crack, you start to rationalize, you start to justify, and uh, before you know it, the door is just kicked wide open. I think one thing in that situation is um, acceptance. I mean, a lot of people have a hard time accepting that, that, that they are you know, alcoholics or that they are a drug addict or anything like that. And uh, it, it is really, really important to get over that, try to get over that stigma because it's really, it is just a word. It's, it's not something, you know, al the alcohol is not who I am. Alcohol is what I did. So um, if, if she is able to actually just come to an acceptance, you know, of that. Um, step one in AA says that we're powerless over alcohol. Once we admit that, then you can move on to the next next step. So, uh, you know, somehow uh, she needs to find acceptance that that is what she does. And how is she going to get, you know, past that? Li and I'll, you know, I, I will tell anybody living a life without alcohol is awesome because and I didn't think I could. I, I went 40 years. I didn't watch a single Chicago Bears game without, without drinking. Now I probably want to start again. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. And I didn't think I could do it. it. Sunday, that's what Sunday was, or if it was Monday or whatever. And now it's, it's not even a second thought. Going to, you know, a Cubs game, same thing. Uh, going to a Cubs game, do, doing whatever. Just it was a knee-jerk reaction. That I had to do it. That it one led to another, and uh, you know, once I, I I had acceptance, that was really what what changed it. Accept acceptance is the most important thing in dealing with addiction because if you don't have acceptance, whether you have humility, gratitude, etc., if in the back of your mind you don't accept that you're an addict or an alcoholic, 
it's not gonna it's not gonna end well. So we ha acceptance is is huge. What, whatever it takes to get her to be able to accept um, what she's done. And again, not a stigma of who she is, because that's not who she is. That's that's what she has done, and have to get her past that. Um, going to those meetings, the um, the phrase about uh, you know, like I said, are the gates of hell opening up? I, I admitted finally that I am powerless over this. I I've proven to myself time and time again, and really that there was nothing wrong with with admitting it. And I'm old world German. We don't admit that we do anything wrong. Basically, <laughs> you know, that's <laughs> that's just not <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just not an option. But uh, once I, and it is a first step in AA, but it also, some AA steps are activity-based. Some are just mental steps. That one's a mental step, and that one's the biggest hurdle to get over because you can't go to step two until you get past that one. So um, I don't, whatever it takes, like, does she go to like any type of meetings, get any help after she comes out of? Okay. Okay. Um, I think that <clears throat> she should, like, I'll say that when Hans went to recovery, he would come, or when he went to um, rehabs, yeah. and then he came out of rehabs, he thought it was going to be an instant fix. Like, he was better, he could take on the world. But what he really needed to do is continue his process of keep on getting help, like going to AA meetings, going to see a recovery coach, continuing to be surrounded by people that were more like-minded, that are different than the people that he hung out with before. So. Yeah, one thing, one thing with, uh, with AA, too, is that uh, we talk about people, places, and things. And uh, we need to avoid the people that may trigger us, places that we go to that may trigger us or things that we do that may trigger us. And if she's able to, um, like I said, be around you guys, be in an alcohol-free environment, um, those are the most important things that, that you can do you know, for her. You can't force her to, to have acceptance, but provide as much of an environment and encouragement as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. Hi, Jenna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have been with my mom for about the past month now. Every Thursday for a farm meeting. Um, it, it, I am almost to day 40 of being sober. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever been in a program like that. I've been sober before, but it is the first time I've like, actually worked with it. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Jenna. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? You want to tell them about oh, the book and right stuff? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, often you see the addiction uh, portrayed in young adults, especially young adults. Mm -hmm. So you often wonder what. So when you were telling the story about getting in the car and driving over as a kid, 
Um, when I when I left uh, here, and that was in uh, um, the Chesterton, Westville area, got in the car. Last thing I remember was stopping to buy alcohol in Wanata. And the next thing I woke up, I woke up the next day. That officer told me when he saw me that um, there were empty, multiple empty vodka bottles in the car. I don't remember a thing. I remember driving through Indianapolis. It was just a complete blackout. And uh, with mental health and, and addiction, if I, I think addiction, everybody in addiction, it, it is a mental health issue, 100%. If you have mental health problems, it doesn't mean you're going to become an addict. But if you are an addict, you do have mental health issues. So it kind of works that way, I believe. Yeah, I do a um, podcast called Healing with Human Connections with a friend of mine that's a therapist, and we've been interviewing different people from the community in regards to mental health and substance abuse, and they pretty much go hand in hand. So it's pretty much you have mental health, addiction, it's all kind of tied together. But you know, also alcohol is a progressive disease, and you know, they think they can have a little bit, and then they need more, and then they need more, and then, you know, before you know it, it's out of control. So it's a, very much a progressive disease. Yes. Yep. Okay, I didn't cause it. So for those of you that is a family member that's dealing with this, sometimes you feel like you um, caused it. They're going to make, that addict is going to make you feel like you are the problem, and that is why they drink. So you did not cause it. You can't control it. So no matter what I wanted to do, there was no way I could control Hans drinking. No way. I mean, no matter, and, and I'll tell you in the book, as a helicopter wife, you know, I knew where his debit card was. I knew exactly how, where he was spending his money. You know, I tracked him on the whatever thing to know where he was at and everything like that. Um, show me your receipts and stuff, not realizing, you know, he could have got money from someplace else. I didn't even know where he got it from. Uh, so you, can, you didn't cause it. You, d you can't control it. You can't cure it. No matter how many times I took cons to the doctor to say, you know, what's wrong with him? You know, we had one doctor one time that said to me, just don't drink. I don't drink. It's easy. Don't drink, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, you know, it was like this was early on. And I'm like, yeah, don't drink because you're causing my life crazy. So, I'm cured. All right. Great. Yeah, you know, or take when he had to go to rehab. And then, you know, um, then he came home and it's like, me too. I thought, well, you went there. You got the help you needed, but uh, you can't cure it. But you can contribute. And you can contribute negatively or positively. And I was contributing very negatively because when he came home and I was busy with the girls and everything and I came home and he was doing his thing and I knew it because you start to see the signs and you know how to read it because I could read his facial, I could smell it, you know, oh, I can't, you know, even if he was drinking vodka. Um, it was, you know, screaming, hollering, mad at him because he's like, a, you know, he's ruining our whole family life and everything. I needed him to take the girls here or there, you know, so... Um, but then I realized that I can contribute either negatively or positively. So if I'm, you know, yelling at him, even drinking again, accusing him of doing these things, he's probably in his mind saying, damn straight, and I'm going to go have myself a drink, you know, because I'm just going to do that because you already know that I've been doing that. So I had to look, change my way of communicating to him. I had to change my way of when he talked to me or not keep bringing up even drinking again or... Because there were times he came home and he wasn't drinking. But I was just so embedded that he was drinking constantly. And so I wasn't even giving him a chance to recover. I was just accusing him from day one that he was doing his thing. So, because I was such a hot mess. Well, okay. 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 Okay.
Podcast Club. Well, what are the things that you could help us to track our listeners? What are some things that are completely impossible to track? Transfer new experience in your own life. And I don't want to, I just want to say that the thing that I learned is that, <coughs> that I learned it from my wife, actually, and from my community culture, that it's very much easy to do is to love them. Yeah. Just accept just them. And I think when Hans is talking about acceptance, I had to learn to accept Hans. I had to learn to accept him to let go and let him do what Hans needed to do. But also, back to your, it's a codependency kind of thing, yeah. you know, where that's kind of how I, I'm um, wired. I want to take care of it. I'm a social worker. I want to fix it. I want to make it better. I don't want people to hurt. I didn't want Hans to hurt. I didn't want him, you know, but... I had to let go and realize that I wasn't doing him any good by contributing. I mean, by so fixing. Did, so for you, what did it look like when you made a positive contribution to Um. Well, maybe Hans can answer what I, I did positively yeah. because then he he knows. Right. He, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it used to be like what she had said. It was. Um, I would uh, come home and I would get the get the hug and be like that kind of hug, and after a while, didn't get it anymore. So, and uh, just like with me, I realized that I wasn't gonna be I wasn't gonna make it right overnight. I didn't get to that point overnight. I'm not gonna fix it overnight. And there were gonna be reservations that they had normal reservations because that's just, I, I had uh, done it for so long that that was just uh, almost like a, a reflex, like a knee-jerk reaction to, to what I was doing. But when, I guess she just, you know, she she just treated me, um, <laughs> I hate to say normal, that's not, not the right word, but when, when you had said love them, I agree. I'd add one word to that, unconditionally. That's a tough one. That's, that's a tough word, too. <laughs> unconditionally. But that's, I mean, the more that that is able to, you know, happen, the, uh, you know, the, the groundwork is laid in order to, to have the addiction, the, the um, recovery take hold. So, yeah, just, I don't want to say avoid addressing it, but just, you know, understanding and uh, accepting me for, like she said, accepting me for for who I am. Yes? I think doing this in process program is really what, what I came to my insight. Because everything that it, you could say was, I didn't trust time, I needed to find out for myself. And then all of a sudden it kind of changed to where I actually trust and have faith that Hans is probably so fast that he's doing what he needs to do. And I think that's where Hans feels it and Lisa feels it, that there was a shift in the trust and Don't 
Nice. God, <laughs> a lot of prayer, and um, and really, you know, God loves us. You know, we screw up over and over and over again. I truly believe that God put cons in my life for a reason. He, um, and that we don't talk about this in the book because it just came to um, my own um, discovery after, because writing the book was very therapeutic, but I was talking about during that time when I was going through this, but then I had a conversation with my older sister, and she said to me, she goes, you know that mom had a drinking problem? And I said, what? And my mom's been gone for 13 years. And my mom and I did not get along with each other. And I didn't know that she had this drinking problem. And then that is why some of those things that triggered me with Hans were triggers that I, so we, like we say, we have to do our own personal inventory. We've got to look back on our own life. What are some things that have happened in our life? I didn't even put two and two together. And I realized that it wasn't all Hans. It was me too. I needed to be forgiven. I needed to be given grace. Um, I tell Hans one of the greatest gifts he could have ever done, no matter if we're still together or not, by the grace of God we are, because uh, there were some roadblocks in the middle that we couldn't get divorced. But, and believe me, I tried to get divorced. Um, it just, God, didn't, God had a different plan. Um, just said, um, we had gone through bankruptcy, and we were in this chapter 13, and the attorney said, how many years do you have left? And I said, well, we just filed, and we got like three years ago. Well, you're still married him for three more years because you can't get divorced because the bankruptcy overrides your divorce. And I'm like, oh, okay, so I got to do something. I got to figure this out. So anyways, um, but no matter what that looked like, by Hans doing the work, I did the work, we can provide that generational, um, we can break that generational gap because the girls know that this runs in their family and this is a disease and um be and Hans and I choose to work on it together and we choose to know that God loved us and he loves us for all and he already knows our story he already knew that this is where we were going so that's how I look at sometimes and I think with what you had said too um also Matthew with the um that forgiveness and unconditional love when you can it's not easy again, but when you can separate the addict from the activity, the person from the addiction, then that's when you can start the, un the unconditional love. The because then you can just focus on the person and and not the addiction. Again, it's not easy, but once you can do that, that's when the forgiveness can, you know, actually start to uh, to take hold. Yeah. And it's it's to the point. There's like little victories too because. Um, I remember after probably about six, it was probably five or six months, and I woke up one day, no, it was even less than that, it was probably three or four months, I woke up one day and I realized that it was easier for me to tell the truth than it was to lie. That was amazing when I woke up and I just realized I didn't have anything to lie about. Like, that, I mean, that was eye-opening. When, um, and even, I, I don't even know when it happened, but I know it's been happening for quite a while that... Um, a lot of times we have an argument, and I'll just go cool down. I'll walk, I'll go drive someplace just to cool down. I know 100% that the thought never crosses her mind that I'm going to go get um, a bottle. And no. it doesn't cross my mind either. So. Amy, did you have something?
You mean when I was actually drinking? Yeah. Um, Um, with me, when I was, I mean, when I was drinking, I, I just didn't care. I mean, I, I flat out didn't care. Um, I thought, especially during suicide attempts, I thought, I truly thought they will be better off without me. I was doing them a favor. As crazy as that sounds, that's kind of where where my mindset was, and, uh, um, and kind of like your question again was what, um, what can like what could Lisa do or somebody in her situation do to help me during those times? At, like Matthew, unconditional love, um, provide like I had mentioned, people, places, things. Try to uh, be there, be supportive. Um, and again, it, it, it's incredibly difficult, but I mean, that's the thing that is going to have the most, uh, most impact on the person is to, to be there, be supportive. And like Lisa said, you can't fix it, but you can, um, you can be there. You can be there uh, to support. You can be there to, um, um, you can be there to, like Nietzsche said, you can help be, uh, the why in their life. Hey! Stand up! <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because judgment is a big thing, um, and actually, when like she was, I, I felt like she was judging me. That was nothing compared to the judgment I was giving myself. Not even close. KJ. Yes, KJ. My, yeah, in my opinion, intervention is a last resort. I mean, it is literally a last resort where you're trying to convince somebody and 
you know, even an intervention, you'll do just about anything to get them to go to, you know, treatment and then deal with it at that time. So yeah, an intervention is, is pretty much a, a, a last resort, you know, type. It's not where you're just going to sit down and talk to them and, hey, you know, we're all good. So most people are. Obviously, if they're in denial and stuff, so they're not going to want to have some people coming in and telling them where they, what they need to do or where they need to go. So. Another one 